There's one thing that we really like to avoid in our dialogues about race. Whiteness. Hey, before we get into this episode, if you like this show and want more episodes on anthropology, consider visiting our Patreon page and becoming a supporter of the show. There are perks. In fact, pledge enough, you can even pick a topic for an episode. Welcome back to another episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. I'm your host, Michael Kilman, and today we're going to dive into our fourth topic on the anthropology of race and talk about whiteness. Now, before we dive in, I highly recommend you check out the three previous episodes on race to make sure you haven't missed something important. To clarify, this episode isn't going to be about Nazis or white supremacists, but the category of whiteness as a cultural object. White supremacy will be an entire episode on its own later. When we talk about race and ethnicity in our society, the thing that usually comes to mind is the people who aren't white. In general, whiteness is viewed as a kind of default setting to be compared to. Things are ethnic or racial compared to whites or whiteness. Why is that? Well, in truth, it is a product of power. Putting it simply, those of European descent have been in power the last few centuries. That impacts our perceptions of those with light skin on both a conscious and subconscious level. And as we discussed in episode 2 and 3 on race, events like Bacon's Rebellion, anti-miscegenation laws, and the rise of the pseudoscientific justification for white supremacy allowed Europeans to do all manner of disturbing things. And as Dr. Jacqueline Batalora wrote in her book Birth of the White Nation, over the course of a hundred years, these awful things we did to non-whites increasingly became a part of the standard legal codes in the United States. But as a result of all this stuff, over time, whiteness became neutral. And anytime any part of your identity is considered neutral or default in society, that's a sign that your group sits in a place of power. But why would any anthropologist want to look at the topic of whiteness? Well, let's see what anthropologist John Hardigan says, considering that he's dedicated a sizable portion of his career thus far to studying race, and more specifically the anthropology of whiteness. In his 2014 book, Race in the 21st Century, he opens his fourth chapter titled Understanding Whiteness by saying, quote, Whiteness is a crucial starting point for thinking about race for two reasons. First, it typically drops out of the picture in such discussions because of the assumption that race refers principally to, quote, people of color. Second, the concepts of race begins with notions of whiteness, the cultural construct that Europeans use to articulate their differences from the rest of the world. So what is whiteness? According to John Hardigan, there are two major factors to whiteness. The first is white privilege, and the second is the fact that whites usually disavow any idea of white collective identity, meaning whites can consider themselves individuals. They don't usually consider them parts of a collective group. Of course, some whites do talk about white collective identity, but that's another story. Before I go on, I want to make the point that all groups, every single one in both the United States and the wider world, are heterogeneous, meaning that no two people, even if they have the exact same race, class, gender, and religion, are identical. In an earlier episode, I talked about how there is a more physical variation within groups than across them. The same is true for cultural variation. Think about how much variety is just in your family. I mean, we have crazy Uncle Ned who wears tinfoil hats and has a picture of Alex Jones that he lovingly caresses each night before bed. We have Cousin Jim, who spends all of his time marching against Trump or really any other cause he can think of. And of course, we can't forget Grandma Betty, whose hoarding has gotten so out of control that she lost an entire litter of kittens under her old copies of Time Magazine. All people, in all groups, are individuals. Yet the way we portray non-whites are as communities, not as individuals. We see this most clearly in the operation of mainstream news narratives. When a white person commits a crime, it's because they were mentally ill, they were a lone wolf for some other reason. But never is the action of a single white person reflected on the entirety of whites, or whiteness. A great example of this is that when in July of 2016, a shooter by the name of Gavin Long, an African American, killed two police officers and injured several more. Instead of claiming this individual was a lone wolf acting on his own, new Numerous media outlets and conservative pundits asserted and entertained the idea that Black Lives Matter was responsible for his actions, despite the fact that BLM has time and again worked hard to maintain itself as a nonviolent organization. In fact, as of July 2017, one police officer from the incident is suing BLM, saying that his injuries from this event were their fault, which, by the way, is really dangerous to both the right to assemble and free speech. Check out this article about that that I linked below. But what about shooters like Dylan Roof, who walked into a church in the name of white supremacy and murdered nine African American individuals in a prayer group? Why isn't the same standard applied? 
The fact that we view some as individuals and some as collective identities is related to white privilege. By the way, in both these cases, the individual does not represent the whole. Gavin Long doesn't represent all black people or Black Lives Matter, and Dylan Roof doesn't represent all white people. We're not all racist. So back in episode 3, I talked briefly about white privilege and its relation to cultural appropriation. But in 1988, Dr. Peggy Maintosh wrote a thought-provoking list called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. The piece was an attempt to make visible whiteness in its everyday operation. The link to the very short read is below, but what she basically demonstrated is that if race and discrimination disadvantage some, then it necessarily must be of advantage to others. A few examples from her piece include I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their daily physical protection. I am never asked to speak for all people of my racial group. I could take a job with an affirmative action employer without having my coworkers on the job suspect it. I got it because of my race. Now, McIntosh's piece isn't perfect. In her 50 criteria, I'm pretty sure that just about any white person could find a few experiences that don't match up perfectly with what she says. And there have been a few changes since 1988. But there are some things to think about in her piece, and it's a great place to start thinking about how the color of your skin plays a role in how you encounter the world as a light-skinned person. Something that most of us, like myself, have never had to think about until someone or something directly confronts us with it, like this YouTube video. Of course, for poor whites, privilege can sometimes be negligible. In her book, White Trash, A 500-Year Hidden History of Class in the United States, Nancy Eisenberg shows us that throughout American history, being poor and white can be an awful position to be in society. And historian Howard Zinn is famous for showing a people's history, the history of the poor who have struggled just to get by regardless of skin color. Now keep in mind, as I said in episode 2 on race, white is a concept that has changed over time. For example, if your ancestors were Italian or Irish, you weren't considered white until relatively recently. In fact, you were probably considered a lubber, rubbish, a clay eater, a degenerate, or a more modern term, white trash. So what is white trash? Well, in short, it's a term for poor whites. Why do we call them trash? To understand this concept of trash, let's turn a moment to a classic text of anthropology, a book written in 1966 by anthropologist Mary Douglas called Purity and Danger, an analysis of the concepts of pollution and taboo. Her work is largely about examining the social relationships that are formed around highlighting what is clean or dirty in society. Pollution is defined as something that will contaminate the established cultural order and norms. Basically, we come to believe it's something that we should avoid or get rid of. This can be as simple as, don't eat that thing of chips you found sitting on top of the medical waste bin. Or as complex as the religious taboos surrounding dietary restrictions like pork in Judaism and Islam. In either case though, what these concepts do is construct ideas for how to behave and who should be included and excluded from society. Of course, we see this all the time with immigration, but that's another episode. This relates to white trash because in general, they're considered a kind of quote, cultural pollutant. We think of them as racist, dirty, poor, lazy, a burden on the system, violent, and dangerous. We call them rednecks, roughnecks, hicks, stupid, ignorant, and all other manner of things that devalue them as human beings. And if you remember from our last episode on race, on eugenics, and social Darwinism, there were all kinds of efforts, including forced sterilization, to exclude these quote, pollutants from society and quote, breed them out of the population. But John Hardigan, in his 2000 book Odd Tribes Towards a Cultural Analysis of White People, shows us that the concept of white trash serves another function for those in power. He says, quote, Part of what the appetite white trash expresses is the general view held by whites that there are only a few extreme dangerous whites who are really racist or violently misogynist, as opposed to recognizing that racism is an institutional problem pervading the nation and implicating all whites in its operation. So basically, white trash is a scapegoat. It's something that we can point to and say, hey, it's those guys over there that are the problem, not the several centuries of oppression or things like the discrimination in our justice system. And to be quite honest, poor whites can also be a victim of the system of oppression. Remember, race is about dividing and conquering. Look, if you're white and watching this, you might think I'm totally full of crap. You may say there's no such thing as systemic racism or that history is just something of the past and we shouldn't worry about it anymore. But if that's the case, why do we have white supremacists marching in our streets or going into churches and killing people? Why are schools just as segregated as they were in the 1950s? Why can you visit pretty much any internet forum and find horrible examples of racism and sexism? I've received wonderful comments on this episode. These things are still very much alive. Understanding whiteness through a social science lens is a powerful tool for fighting back against them. In order to make change, we have to correctly diagnose the problem. That's why it's important to look at whiteness. Well, that's all for this episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. We'll see you next time.